Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday session. And uh, I'll be talking this morning as well as this afternoon. The first part of the talk is about, uh, is a critique of the quantity theory of money. And this afternoon I'll try to relate it to how this works in the gold standard and real bills. Now, Professor Feketa gave all of us a, a handout, lecture 18, critique of the quantity theory of money. And I suppose you've all read this, so I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, <coughs> very clear what it is. However, the quantity theory of money is pretty deeply embedded in, in our belief systems. So, uh, in theory, well, in scientific theory, no theory can be proven. It can only be disproven. One ugly fact destroys a beautiful theory. Because the theory doesn't, is not congruent with the fact, the theory must be thrown out or changed. However, I'll take at least two looks from two different points of view on this quantity theory. One is an internal illogic of the very theory itself, and the other one is a more Austrian or Mengerian look at what this really means. Um, so to look at the internal logic, the monetarists claim that all the Fed or whoever has to do is increase the money supply at a nice steady rate. Friedman said, a well-trained horse walking on a treadmill cranking out 2% money per year would handle all the problems. Well, <laughs> you know, it's kind of silly, but that's what they say. So first of all, what is GDP? Uh, GDP is a measure, and it's not a good measure. Admittedly, it, it's supposed to mean gross domestic product. And it's not gross because some things are netted out. And it's not domestic because import exports change the numbers. And as far as being a product, it includes government borrowing and spending, which is not productive at all, and that messes it up. And finally, it's in nominal uh, numbers, not real numbers. However, that's beside the point. Um, if, you, if you convert it to real numbers, it gives you some indication. And if you look at the same GDP numbers over, over a few years, you at least get some trends out of it. But that's still beside the point. The point is that the GDP is the sum of all financial or monetary transactions in a geographic location, that is a country, one nation, over a period of years. So it kind of goes like this, very simple. GDP equals transaction one plus transaction two plus transaction three, transaction N. You add them all up for a year, there's your GDP. Now, of course, you can argue about what is money. Is it M1, M2, MZN, M3? Let's just keep to one of them and say, to be consistent, we're going to use kind of cash money, money of zero maturity. So let's take an example of, of a real country. And let's say the GDP number is $10 trillion, which is roughly what the US GDP is. <coughs> And how do you get this? Well, it's a certain amount of money in the country that changes hands. Obviously, there's money changing hands here. If you buy a mug of beer, there's a transaction. If you get a salary, there's a transaction, whatever. And if you, if you buy your supper on credit, there's a transaction that's incomplete, and it's completed when you pay back the credit. So there's still a transaction. So let's suppose, them, you know, this is your GDP number. This is your money supply number. And let's say your money supply is 1 trillion. Why do we get to T? Uh, I'm sorry, to 10 T. Well, you have to multiply it by 10. And this is called the velocity of money. So in effect, the equation is GDP equals money supply times velocity of money. Now notice immediately there's something wrong here because you can just as easily get 10 trillion by saying you've got 2 trillion money supply times 5. You get exactly the same GDP and with a 100% increase in money supply if the velocity is a half. Or you get 10 trillion, 0.5 times 20. So how can you say a mere 2% increase in this number per year keeps this, this thing stable? It's nonsense. 
So obviously, right now, you can throw out this theory. Done, my speech is over. <laughs> Not quite. Uh, this money supply thing has some input from the Fed. Obviously, they can uh, create money at will, destroy money, so they have some control of this. And you can argue there's fractional reserve and some borrowing comes in. Nevertheless, they've got some handle on this. This other one, the spending of the money depends on whoever owns it. Um, all of us. Do we spend our money quickly? Do we save more? And in fact, right now what's happening is the US and I suppose the rest of the world, the saving rates are increasing, which means the, money, the velocity of money is decreasing. Now, it hasn't chopped in half, but it has decreased substantially. It can never go to zero because that would mean people don't have food to eat, but it can certainly go down. And this is considered to be deflationary. And in order to keep the 10 trillion <coughs> GDP number, this money supply has to be increased so that the two sides of the equation balance. And this is considered inflationary. Clearly, if the same amount of money were to be circulating a lot faster, the equation's out of whack. In fact, it cannot go to zero, but it can go to infinity, which is another way of calling a hyperinflation, the velocity of money. Now, the quantity of theory of money, if you hold this constant, it works pretty good. So for a while, if this is constant, that's okay. And just a quick aside, Professor Fekete mentioned the Austrian concept of the evenly rotating economy. Is anybody familiar with that? Okay. Well, instead of a static picture, let's say you take a snapshot of the economy today and you compare it to tomorrow. You look at the dynamics of it. Money flows, purchases, sales, and all of these are going on, moving on. Think about a car engine. A car, you're driving on a level road at a fixed speed, calm wind, temperature is fixed. You know, you're, you're, you're on cruise control. Your engine is dynamic, but nothing really changes. The dynamics are constant. So you've got gas going in and air going in and stuff like that. And of course, this is an imaginal thing because in the real economy, things do change but at least it's a more dynamic thing. So if you assume that this is held steady, this works. As soon as you realize that this can change, this does not work. Now, inherent in this, there are some problems. Like I said, this is, this is controlled by the Fed or the, or the authorities. Let's say Fed. And this is basically controlled by the market. And who says these things have the same motivation or the same timing? And if the, the, let's, let's look at the other question. Um, is everybody okay with this? I can get rid of this, right? Oops. Uh, we looked at the demand for means of exchange in a yearly cycle, if this is January, and we got the different months, and then we go to the next, next January, to January of the next year. After Christmas, let's see, and this is, this is demand, this is transactions being played out, call it uh, the velocity of money, whatever you want. And it kind of trickles down, and then maybe, some, maybe it picks up in the spring and decreases, and next Christmas is coming, it increases, and there's our cycle. So we've got variations in the demand for consumer goods. And there's a multiplier effect here, because every consumer good uh, that you buy at the store, or whoever, involves many different trades, many different processes. If you buy a loaf of bread, that means somebody had to bake it, there was a transaction. Somebody had to make the flour, there was a transaction. Uh, somebody had to grow the grain and so on. And if you think about a more sophisticated product like an automobile, one car purchase triggers many, many financial transactions. So I consider this to be gain. This, uh, this is more of an engineering term, but if you if we look at one gold coin under a uh, gold standard, can create or bring into being many, many real bills. And the same kind of thing happens under fiat currency as well. Your, your, your purchase triggers a bunch of other things. So 
There has to be, what I'm trying to get to is there has to be enough flexibility in the system to accommodate these changes. And if the quantity of money is the right the theory being used, there's no real built signal going, there's only uh, price signals. So if prices respond very slowly, they don't respond instantly. So if you, if let's suppose the quantity of demand drops, the prices will be pretty steady. It's not going to change quickly. And if the Fed, what is the Fed watching? Well, they, they, they don't know anything about real bills. They're watching prices, maybe they're watching some other stuff. And the point being that there's a lag. As this thing grows up, the money supply doesn't really grow, and things are out of whack. The, the, the feedback loops are missing. And I'm going to talk about this more this afternoon. But be aware that uh, nobody in, well, is anybody in engineering in this room? No. no. Anybody understand servo theory, feedback, that kind of stuff? No. Okay. I got to talk about this a little bit. Unfortunately, all the people who are in Congress are lawyers and they don't have a clue. Uh, in electronics, for example, there's a thing called a comparator, an amplifier, which has two inputs and one output. Your input is, is coming in here, your input signal. And this is connected to the output, and this is called feedback. Okay? So the comparator looks at the input, and let's suppose the input looks something like this. For argument's sake, one cycle, simple, some variable input. The output has to look theoretically like this. It's taking the signal and amplified it, okay? Similar to in the financial business, you take uh, consumer goods going up and down. Remember, we had this little uh, variation from year to year. And perhaps some variations coming from other reasons, you know, a disaster or change in preference or whatever. Now, the theory of this is pretty simple. It says that this feedback has to be responding much faster than the signal changes. In other words, you have to look at this quickly so that the device internally can reproduce this signal larger. Is that okay? And if you look at it, here's your signal again, and you only look at it one, two, three times, well, the output signal is going to be distorted. It's going to look like Something like this, not at all like the input signal, because there's a lag. Okay, so the, the economy doesn't respond properly. Now this gets worse. If the feedback loop is quite slow and of the same order of magnitude as the signal changing, you can have a resonance effect. Your signal input and your output are out of phase, and the input starts to drive the output farther and farther. If you look at that chart, this chart, this chart is called total bank credit continues to contract. Well, they're looking at this last blip. Now I'm looking at the history of this. You had basically a flat line till 1971 when gold was disconnected from the loop and this feedback started to really take wild swings. And that's exactly the reason because there's a, only a very slow response to changes in market demand. The feedback loop theory predicts this. This is well understood in engineering. There's an equation for it. And I'm not a mathematician. I don't know what the equation is. But I've played with servo systems, and I know that you can have lazy response. You can have overshoot feedback. If you ever go to a, a room and listen to somebody talking in a microphone, and go, Ee! you've all heard that. That's a feedback loop when the thing goes crazy. And it maxes out the amplifier clips. It can't make the noise louder. But here, we don't know if it's at the maximum or the minimum. Maybe the economy can survive this, and maybe the next little shoot will be up here, and maybe this way, or maybe it's just done. We don't know. But the feedback loop comes in, or I should say the, uh, the destruction of the fast response of the real bills has, got, has caused this, uh, this problem. So not only is the theory incorrect, but it 
pretty well predicts this kind of stuff happening. There's a, there's a, a loss of connection between the input and output, and it gets out of whack, and the Fed is busy trying to keep up with dropping velocity of money, and just about the time when velocity starts to return, they're still pumping like crazy, so this goes, oh my god, it's going up, let's start taking liquidity out, but it's too late to catch that, and they're trying to catch something that's dynamic and moving. Static stability is this. You get a poke, done, finished. Once it's this way, it's stable, you, it, it, you have to lift it to make it tip. This way we have neutral stability, because it doesn't matter which way you put it, or you have real, this has got real stability now. This way it's not very stable, a small poke will make it fall. But in dynamics, this is an ongoing process. Think of a juggler holding a, I think, you know, he's got a, you have a feedback loop, and he's got to adjust his position, or else the thing falls over. The real bills do that perfectly well, and we'll talk about that more later. So there's two problems already, the detachment of uh, uh, quantity, or, or I should say money supply, and from the GDP because of that factor that that's not considered. So, that's, that's the internal logic. Now from a Mengarian logic, uh, an external look at this, this problem, I'm going to touch a little bit about Austrian economics. Anybody study Austrian economics here? You don't count. <laughs> you're, you're on the... <laughs> Austrian economics starts with, well, it's like the professor said, if you have a horse market, you cannot go smaller than one horse. And Austrian economics talks about human action, and you cannot go smaller than one human being on his own, which is Robinson Crusoe on a deserted island. And people say, oh, this is nonsense, this is, you know, Crusoe economics, ha, 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 we've got a, I've got a PhD in uh, partial differential equations, and what are you talking about? Well, this is what I'm talking about. This is a tree. And if you're up in the branches and the leaves, there's massive amounts of complexity, little twigs intertwining and moving around, and then you move back down to the main branches, and it gets a little bit simplified. And when you're at the root, the trunk, very simple, there's one. So you've got to understand this to be able to go there, and you can go up and follow the, from the fundamentals, build up, I guess you call that inductive, or you can go to the leaves and complexities and follow them back down deductive. But if you're up here somewhere with some complexities that are disconnected from the root, it's nonsense, it's obfuscation, it's BS. So what does, what does Robinson Crusoe have to do on his little island? Well, he arrives there with practically nothing. His very first thing is survival, for the moment. Find food, find shelter, find water, whatever. Okay. What's the second thing he has to do? Well, he may have to think about tomorrow. He may have to store some water for tomorrow if there's dry spells. He may have to store food if the harvest is seasonal. He needs to store value. Now, he has no need for barter, not even barter, because there's nobody to barter with. Certainly no need for money, any of this stuff, but store of value is already there. At the very fundamental. Let's say store value. What else? Well, suppose he builds himself a basket. He makes a basket so that when he goes to the berry field, he can bring back not a handful of berries, but a whole basket full, make his life easier and more productive. Or he, or he weaves a fishnet. This is called capital accumulation. <laughs> right? It's savings. It's not spending time soaking in the sun, it's not gathering food. It's actually thinking of tomorrow, making his life more efficient, more productive. So before we have money, before we have barter, direct exchange, indirect exchange, we already have these things, fundamental, fundamental. There's another thing he might do. He might just be walking along the beach, oh look, there's a pretty shell, and he'll bend over and pick it up, a pretty shell, and bring it back to his, to his cave or his shelter. Why did he do that? He can't, it's not, is it value? Is it food? Is it, is it, you know, well, he likes it. He's human. 
So there's a thing of beauty and so on. And what happens if he finds a little shiny nugget of gold there? Is it possible that he'll pick it up? Not to eat it, not to do anything with it, just because it's kind of nice. So this stuff starts very fundamentally too. Now then, once you get into you know his buddy Thursday or Friday or whoever comes along, other laws of economics become apparent. Um, the, the, the efficiency of the division of labor. Instead of both of them going fishing and walking down to the river and both of them going gathering berries, one does this, one does that, they end up doing their, their work more efficiently. And uh, the law of comparative advantage shows up. If, if Robinson Crusoe is a great fisherman, he knows where the fish are, he'll do the fishing. And the other guy is good at climbing trees, he'll be the one picking coconuts, not the other way around. A lot of comparative advantage plays out in international trade. If so one country has gold mines and another one has apple orchards, they swap this. So then we can go from you know, the two people on the island to tribal where uh, barter comes in. And we already touched on it how from exchange of stuff the most marketable commodity starts to develop into money. And the reason I bring this up some people think that or say that money is nothing but a means of exchange. Well, maybe. But if that's true, they still mean humanity needs to store value. It's so fundamental. So if, there's, if money is not a good store of value, something else needs to serve that purpose. So either individual people start to hoard food and shoes and shirts and God knows what else, whatever they think they need because the money is no good, or they use their money to buy another item which is a good store of value, maybe platinum coins, and then exchange that for money and then go out and buy the food they need. But you see it's less efficient. So money should be a good store of value. And guess what? That which became the very best money, gold, is the ultimate store of value. It doesn't corrode, it, it, it's not destroyed by overproduction, etc., etc. So that's a little touch of the Austrian thing. Now, we talk, uh, Sandy already touched on, and Professor touched on, the, the, the farmer with the sacks of grain. How the first sack of grain is used to feed himself, the second is seed, corn, uh, seed grain, the third was uh, feed the animals, and so on. So the, 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 the grain is put to less and less important use, its marginal utility declines. Well, I want to turn this in a slightly different picture once this grain uh, is not as, the second sack is not as important as first or not as valuable and so on, something else takes the place of that number one sack of grain. So I'd like to talk about extreme condition. Somebody is lost in the Sahara Desert, facing dying of thirst. Uh, will he value his diamond higher than a bottle of water? Probably not. So. Now, under these conditions, water is more valuable than diamonds. His number one thing is to get water, and suppose he meets some sharp trader on a camel and uh, says, hey, I'll sell you some water. What will you pay me? Oh, well, and then he drinks the water, and he's a little better. Well, you want another one? Oh, yeah, yeah. And another one, clearly, as you bring in more and more water, he says, no, I, I can't drink anymore, thank you, but I'd love to have a canteen full of water for tomorrow. His value scale just flipped. From the most important thing being water, it became canteens. Then he gets canteens and you know, he starts stringing the canteens on, he's got six in his hand. I don't want another canteen, but you know what? Sell me a camel to carry all this water. His value scale flipped again. Now he wants a camel, that's the highest one. And the next thing could be a compass so he could find his way out or food or who knows, that's the point. And so we've established a value scale and the most important thing in their shifts. But did we establish a price for this water? Well, none of this bidding and offering not took place. So think about it this way. There's two guys lost in the desert. One of them is Joe Sixpack and the other one is Bill Gates. <laughs> is it possible or likely that Bill Gates can afford to pay a lot more for the water than Joe Sixpack? Clearly. But that still doesn't determine the value. The value cannot be measured. And somebody mentioned cardinal and ordinal, that's where it comes in. You can't put a number of dollars to it, really. It doesn't make sense because the price is not established except through market action. But you can put a value on it. 
And just as it's the most important thing in Bill Gates' life at that moment is mug of water, so it is in Joe's six pack. So during this three and um, say so we have we have a value scale. This is value and this is quantity. And all we can say is, <coughs> excuse me, you know, from zero to ten, arbitrarily just pick a number. A value scale of one to or one to ten, whatever you like. Water is right up here, and then as he gets more water, it's, it goes down. And at a certain point, we say it can't go negative, but if some guy's drowning in a river, maybe it is negative. Right? <laughs> and what flips up here, this is his highest value, is water. Then as he's got this, now it's canteens. And then that drops off, and then it's a camel. And then it's whatever, food or thing. Okay, this can go on forever. So how does, what does he use to buy his water? Money. What does he use to buy the canteens? Money. What does he use to buy the camel? Money. What does he buy the next thing with? Money, money, money. Every increment of money ever spent always satisfies the highest demand of the moment on that person's value scale. He doesn't buy this stuff, he buys this stuff. And then he buys that stuff, and then he buys that. So this is an indication that the marginal utility of water declines, canteens declines, camels decline pretty quickly. Money stays, in this measure, constant. Did anybody, um, anybody buy that or agree with this? Yeah. Okay. So uh, there's a handout, I don't know if you got it yet, and some of you guys did. Um, conventional uh, economics, and then you've got your uh, converging, your, what do you call a supply demand curve, right? Well, we can put this on a supply demand curve, and here is this traditional supply demand curve, and it's, and it's dollars or, or price or whatever, and then quantity, right? And there's two things that cross like this. If the price is high and demand is low, and if the price drops, the demand picks up, the quantity picks up. So this is your demand, right? Correct me if I'm wrong here. Yes. Okay. And this is your supply, because if the price is low, there's little supply. Price is high, the supply picks up, and then you, your market clearing price, whatever, uh, this is your actual price that, that it converges to, supposedly. Okay? <laughs> but, well, when it comes to money, there's no real, you can't say the price of money, but you can certainly say the purchasing power of money. So if we draw the same thing up here, quantity, call this purchase price, now supply. Does it look like this? Well, if, you know, if you're talking about gold, for example, if the purchase price of gold is low, nobody's going to dig the stuff out of the ground because it may cost more to mine it then its purchase power will bring. But if the purchase power increases, yeah, there'll be more mines, maybe people will melt their jewelry, whatever. But we just said the demand was constant. So if we shift this over, if we shift this over here, you get a different point, right? That's how it works? Well, with this, it doesn't work. Demand is constant. So there you go, another bullet in the supply, uh, demand supply theory, or quantity theory of money. Now, there's another interesting point here. This purchase power is kind of arbitrary, and you could draw this line really anywhere. D1 or D prime. Doesn't matter. So what does that mean? Well, it means the actual quantity of money in an economy is irrelevant that the market will settle the purchase power question soon enough through the bidding process. And so trying to set a dollar value to gold is, is an exercise in futility. It, it's going to find its own level. If some people are saying, let's move to the gold standard, but then we have to price gold. And of course, then there's an argument, those who hold gold want a high price, those who don't hold gold want a low price. It, it, it's, it, it doesn't work. But by this, it's not a problem. 
So if, the monk, if, the, if you accept the constant marginal utility of money, then, then this thing, the Ishtar full of bullets again. So those are my two arguments against or critiques of the quantity theory. How are we doing for time, Sandy? Uh, we're fine. Uh, nine, not uh, ten five. Okay, so any questions or any uh, feedback? Uh, yeah, Louis. How can you, uh, you made a comment just at the end there that um, the, 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 if we were to introduce the gold standard, for example, there's this criticism that those who have gold Mm -hmm. who, uh, will, ask for a high, will be better for the high price and those who don't. Sure. Well, and then you said, according to that chart, it doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't. Why? So, well, because the purchase power of the gold will be set by the quantity of gold versus the quantity of real goods or the changeover. I'm, I'm, we're going to come to this a little bit more in this afternoon. I really think you need to... The word inflation is very... Um, I don't know, it's kind of like, what is inflation? Is it an increase in prices? No, but it's coming back Sorry. to the price of gold. Yes. Because you, you mentioned the price of gold would not be affected. Uh, I, I, okay, maybe I didn't express this very clearly. If, if someone wants to establish a direct transition from paper to gold, then, then you have to come up with a number. Um, when uh, East Germany collapsed and the West Germans took it over, they bought out the East Mark or whatever it was. And there was a big debate over how much they would get for this. And it ended up they paid too much and it, they're still suffering, etc. So I don't think that's the way to go. The way to go is let go of this idea and just say, well, there's gold in circulation and there's silver in circulation and what it will fetch is it will be determined by the market rather than trying to go from paper directly to gold. That's, that's really what I meant. Because at the end of the day, now, changes in the purchase power do matter. It's kind of like interest rates in a way. If they're steady, there's not a big problem. Everybody can work with that. But if they're changing, then there's a problem. And if, if, if it's set arbitrarily low, cut, again, it's not a market phenomenon. I mean, let this bid offer thing play out and let the market determine what is the purchase power of gold versus the purchase power of the paper currencies. You know, I think that's, that's one way to look at it. Yes. Uh, another question to this constant marginal utility which you're referring to. Yes. <coughs> um, I, I mean, it's also a theori theoretical argument, but if you have uh, unlimited supply of gold, yes. then well, there must be some limit to this. There's a good question. Sure, there's a limit. As soon as Sandeep perfects his technology of extracting gold from seawater at no cost, this will collapse. And I'm not holding my breath. He quoted me a million dollars an ounce to do it, so that's a joke. But don't forget through history, money has changed. There was iron, and iron was a pretty good money, I suppose it was used, until people discovered a way to create iron from ore. It was no longer native iron, but it had to be produced, and as the production efficiency increased, there was just too much of it, so I said, let's do something else. And then copper was money. Copper is still a bit of money, you know, your pennies and so on. And then silver was promoted to being money along with gold, etc., etc. And if, yeah, if, if, I mean, this cannot, infinite supply of gold clearly would destroy this thing. And something else would have to take its place. So I, I, it's a good question. But it's very far out, you mean? So well, I believe so. Well, there's another thing, too. Think about it this way. Uh, the early gold was easy to find, the low-hanging trees, you know, there were lumps of gold sitting in the creek bed and you, you, you took a shovel and a pan and wow, gold. Well, <laughs> most of that's gone. Now you've got to move uh, how many tons of ore to get an ounce? You know, you've got tremendous huge machinery digging out enormous, what's that, how much? I don't thousands. Know. Thousands. So, so as the technology has improved, the cost, the real cost of acquiring gold has increased. So to do that mining of 2,000 tons a year takes more and more real input, big diesel engines and big trucks and chemicals and whatnot. So that's another reason why gold keeps its value, because it's harder to get. If it was relatively, if it was getting easier and easier and easier to get gold, at some point it would collapse. It would just, that'd be just too much. Now, uh, you guys have brought up some other objections that I'm going to bring up to critique this critique. 
What about the, the 49ers when the gold was discovered in America? Wasn't there inflation? Well, locally there was. Because these guys found gold, they were rich, they were spending money like crazy. And remember one thing, just to get there, to get to California, you had to take a, a sail ship around the Cape of, uh, around Cape Horn, around South America. Or trek across the continent on a horse or a buggy. There was no railroads yet. And <laughs> to get anything there was enormously expensive. So yeah, there was price increases there naturally. And then people talk about, well, what happened when the Spaniards got all this gold? Wasn't there inflation in Spain? But this was another issue. This was stolen gold. Stolen gold. They went out there, they grabbed it, they said, ah, we're rich. Well, there was no digging and no earning and no even playing field. And actually it destroyed their economy because people no longer had to produce real goods in order to do this transaction business. If your monetary system de <coughs> detaches from the real economy, there's a problem. And today it's extremely detached from the real economy. And I, you kind of think inflation could be monetary inflation. Monetary inflation or real inflation. And this is quite connected to money and so on. So but real inflation is loss of purchase power of your own energy, of your own effort. If you earn $10, oh, let's not say $10, let's say your, your labor earns you a cup of coffee. Uh, one hour work for, well that's not right, maybe one minute work earns you a cup of coffee. I don't know, take a number. Bottle of wine. Bottle of wine. What a good one. Now, if the bottle of wine increases in monetary terms double, and your wages increase double, there's no difference. Because you still work one hour for uh, a bottle of wine. So you get monetary inflation, increase in nominal prices, but the real inflation hasn't occurred. Suppose your uh, wages stay the same, but the price of the bottle of wine doubles. Now you've got to work two hours for that freaking bottle of wine. Not good. Or it could be the opposite way. You know, you can get the same money, but the, the price of the bottle of wine goes down. So these are two separate things, and deflation and inflation is kind of an interplay between them. But this is the one that really counts. And this is the one that's hidden. And um, I like to do a little tirade about inflation. My, you guys are mostly young guys, so maybe this is in your grandfather's day, but in my father's day, one wage earner supported the family easily, comfortably. They had their own house, paid for it, probably a car, uh, food, enough money for all the things they needed in their life. And then something happened, it became harder to make ends meet. Oh, you know, we're having problems. Maybe daddy had to get a second job driving a taxi at night. Or maybe, maybe mama had to get a job because the kids are grown up to make ends meet. And today, two earner family is in the US six weeks away from bankruptcy, the average, six weeks. If one wage earner loses the job, that's how much cushion they have. Why? Well, that's your inflation target. Two percent. That's the target. Every year you lose two percent on your purchasing power. But it's not 2%, clearly inflation is a lot higher than that. But it's very insidious and it's very destructive. And um, I hate it. And that's another reason to hang these guys by the by their thumbs. <laughs> well, you, you got the rope? Let's go. <laughs> so that's the inflation and uh, targeting. So, you know, there's a lot of obfuscation hiding all this stuff behind, behind the facade, behind the curtain. Instability and a, a reduction in the real standard of living. I think since the late or mid 70s, US wages have not kept up with inflation. There's been a real decline. And of course, I'm not even gonna talk about all the taxes and all this shit. I mean, this is all part and parcel of it. Would it be, yes. fair, would it be fair to say that uh, the uh, current uh, monetary system is intrinsically inflationary? Yes. It, 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 Definitely say that. That's the target. You know, well, it's not that it's the target. Okay. It, it must be inflationary to survive, to continue. Yes, I have to agree with that. Yeah. And, and um, the, the real bills of their gold standard, would, they be, would that be intrinsically deflationary or just neutral? In my opinion, it's neutral on that level of transaction because a real product 
creates a real bill. That's why it's called a real bill. And whatever the value, the market value, the sales value of that product is, that's the value of the bill drawn against it. And if the price of that product changes, the value of the bill drawn on its delivery changes. So if the price of wheat goes up and you deliver 10 bushels of wheat, that real bill will reflect this increase in price. Is that okay? You understand what I'm saying? Or if the gold price, if the gold price of wheat goes down, for the same quantity of wheat, a smaller bill will be drawn. It has to be. Yeah, but there is no credit involved. And well, uh, now this is a touchy point. There is credit involved, but there's no borrowing involved. Well, that, that's what I mean. There's, there's, no, there. there's no additional. There's no additional supply of money. No, no. Again, I'm going to talk more about this this afternoon. Okay. How? Because I said this money, money supply. Really, the definition of money, um, the definition of inflation. I think Wikipedia is an increase in cash and credit uh, larger than the increase in the quantity of goods, cash and credit. Because you can buy stuff on credit on your Visa card as long as you pay it back. So. And in the, under the real bills, gold is the cash, and the real bills are the credit, but they are self-liquidating, not only because yeah. they, they that, that's a crucial difference. That's a crucial difference. It is. Well, look at the, the money piling up in the Chinese um, <coughs> central bank vaults, that, or, or in their computer entries, whatever it is, trillion plus, God knows how much. It's ridiculous. With real bills, they can't pile up. They, 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 they disappear, they're paid off, and it goes back to the gold. What's your correct uh, definition of inflation? Well, there's no one definition. There's monetary inflation and real inflation. I think you've got you to look at them separately. Just as there's no price, there's a, a spread. And there could clearly be a spread here. I just understand one thing. As we talk, I'm learning stuff. And what I just said now, oh, there's a spread. That just popped into my head. And <clears throat> this spread is maybe going to drive the reintroduction of gold standard. Could that be possible? Because it goes completely out of whack? Uh, yes, Peter. Hmm. Rudy, I think, I think it's perhaps helpful to define issues like inflation, deflation, and the base. Mm -hmm. um, what I think in Hungarian terms is inflation is the period of rising interest rates, long-term interest rates, not <coughs> discount for it. Deflation is a period of lowering and falling interest rates and debasement could be a term used for stretching the measurement scale. Sure. Well there's several ways to look at this. Just to separate the issues otherwise Yeah. Okay. That's why that's why I want to break it on two things. Uh, you look at this you guys look at this other chart if you had a chance to peek at it. What we're seeing, what I'm seeing here is little blips and then a gradual decline, another little blip and a decline, a blip, a little decline, and then it goes not so, right? This is the prices. Maybe you can take a shot of it. Well, we'll put it in the videos from the graphic. And this is from 1774. So I first looked at it, I said, gee, I thought under a gold standard there's a gentle, constant decline in prices. Where is it? And I see it's there and it's interrupted by blips. Well, those blips are war. Every time there's a war, there is what? There's destruction of capital. Destruction of fixed capital, machinery, railroad tracks, whatever. Uh, destruction of this stream of moving capital, the um, social circulating goods. You know, you have a train full of cattle destroyed or, or grains or whatever. Human capital. Uh, Sandy put this so well. He said the cream of British society was wiped out first few weeks of World War One, the, the very best, the leaders, the ones who got up and said, I must do this, and they died. And of course this happened to the French guys, the Hungarian guys, the German guys. So human capital, those entrepreneurs who could figure out how to reduce the spread, to reduce prices, those inventors, all those people are killed, human capital, human resources. So obviously, real inflation takes place, less goods, no matter how you measure it, whatever, whatever monetary value, you have to work more hours per day to earn whatever you need. And you may have to dig your own goddamn little pot of soil to grow a cabbage so you don't starve to death. I mean, you, you, you've heard the stories about war. So if the real 
cause of real inflation is capital destruction and all kinds of capital, then who's to say that the destruction of capital by other means than war is not inflationary? In other words, it doesn't take war to destroy capital. It can be destroyed by swing of the interest rates, the wrecking ball. It can be destroyed by... It took 75 years for the capital of Eastern Bloc to be destroyed through, through neglect, through not doing the right uh, depreciation quotas. That's putting it into fine detail. Basically, the capital is not replaced, it's destroyed. So the country goes down slowly instead of going down quickly. Instead of a blip, whoop, war in, in, in one minute or whatever, Hiroshima was destroyed and Dresden took a few hours and all of Europe took months. Yes, but these blips, as you call them, also definitely include uh, monetary inflation because sure. the, in every case and in every case yes. they, they went off the gold standard and printed money and uh, That's right. financed the war with inflation. No question. And, and in fact, the irony, if you will, is if countries absolutely positively stay on the gold standard, war is impossible. Um, at least a significant war. Certainly the total war of the 20th century. Before first World War, first World war started, everybody was going off gold, legal tender laws were introduced, gearing up for printing money because they couldn't tax people enough to pay for the war and they couldn't borrow enough even. And the pundits were predicting the war cannot last more than a few months because at this rate of expenditure the treasuries will be depleted. And not just depleted, sent across to the other ocean for goods and then maybe a trade imbalance. Totally destroyed. Think about it. All this money used to build tanks and guns and bullets wiped out. So all this capital is, is destroyed. Huge capital destruction. And another thing is, what about capital misallocation? If the Japanese government decides to build a bridge from here to there to no purpose and spends 10 billion yuan, God knows on it, isn't that in a way destruction of capital? You take money that could have been used for a useful purpose and you do something completely useless with it. It's another form of capital destruction. And, you know, again, the gold standard reflects this much better than the paper standard, obviously. And uh, right now, a lot of bad stuff is happening. Uh, yes. uh, I have a question about the uh, inflation target of 2%. Well, it doesn't sound that high, but uh, if I understand it correctly, it's an uh, annual inflation of 2%. Yes. Uh, relative to the, so it's always relative to the past year. Is it correct? Well, this is a, this is a target. I mean, it really doesn't mean much. Uh, it, or any inflation. It's okay. always relative to the beginning of the year. Right? Well, yes, it's a yearly increase. What they, what they really want to say by this is increase the money supply relative to the quality of goods by 2% a year. But it's never achieved because inflation is much higher than 2% a year. And even so, if it was only 2% a year, you'd have a compounding effect over 20, 30, 40 years. That's huge. Now, the other thing is, under a gold standard, it's the opposite. There is a certain monetary deflation, that is the purchase power of gold relative to your hour work increases because you earn more real you earn more real wages because you become more productive. All those entrepreneurs figure out ways to do things better. All those inventors figure out new tools and new techniques to plow the field faster and to, to ship it. Compare shipping a couple hundred years ago. It took a hundred sailors in the rigging and now, today, a super tanker has a crew of a dozen people and a bunch of computers, a super tanker. So how much more productive are these people? How much more real wealth and real economic activity do they achieve? Uh, yes, Luis. Just to uh, piece of Vero's point, uh, okay. 2% seems yeah. very low, but it doesn't matter what the rate is, if it's continuously compounded. Yes. It's going to generate an effect such as the uh, exponential curve. Eventually, yes, and of course. Exponential curve is uh, a mathematical uh, phenomenon that we must all understand. Yeah, well, I agree. There's a lot of things to understand. And, and because it's continuously compounding, what appears to be negligible eventually compounds on itself and becomes. Uh, the, the, we're here right now. We're, we're, that's, that's where we are. So that's where we've been. Now we're here. So basically, in absolute numbers, 2% out of 100 
is not. Okay, but don't get caught up on the number. The number is not the problem. If it's 3%, well, the problem is the lie it rep represents, a reprehensible lie. People are convinced that this is the right thing. Oh my God, we've got to target this. And if we go under it, oh, we've got horrible consequences. Deflation will occur and, and everything collapses. Nobody looks at this or they, don't, they divert attention from reality. Now, monetary deflation is happening, obviously, but that's not the real issue. The real issue is here. What's happening to the real economy, the productive economy? Let me give you another example. When people, entrepreneurs and inventors and so on, figure out better ways to move stuff and grow stuff and make stuff, there's improvements. Today, the very best and brightest are not shot on the front. They simply go into the financial community. They're the quants. They figure out how to rip off money better. They figure out how to staple a stack of mortgages together and chop it up in other ways to make you know, profits for themselves. So all the emphasis is on, on that. And it's, it kind of comes from here. And it comes from the fact that paper money and so on and so forth. Which we'll talk about more this afternoon. Yes, yes. Oh, one minute. Okay, well, I don't know. No more questions? <laughs> I would just like to make a comment, Ruth. Just a, a slight dissension in that which I can't articulate. I'm not, I would just like to say that I'm not entirely yeah. happy with the, okay. the real inflation. I just don't quite. You don't quite get this, or what? I can't quite agree with that at the moment. I'm just making that as a comment, but so I'll come back to you on that later. Okay, well, fine. I'm, by all means, I love feedback, and, mm -hmm. and if you disagree with any of this, or it's not clear, or you have a better idea, I'd love to hear it. I agree with everything right there. Yeah. <laughs> that was, that was fine. Well, what else do you call the, the, the collective productivity of society? I mean, give it a name. I, it's, you can call it productivity, you can call it progress. And, you know, progress occurs and then a war happens and we regress. Why is that term out there, we're going to bomb you back to the Bronze Age or the Stone Age? Why? That's what it means. If you destroy all the capital and all the stuff, you, you get the Stone Age right there. And worse than the Stone Age because there aren't those low-hanging fruit, the easy-to-mine stuff. See, the world has changed. The physical world has changed. So how much harder is it to, to do this from scratch again if supposedly you mine back to the uh, Stone Age? Mm -hmm. Tell me, yeah. Um, about the GDP, you wrote a formula. GDP is uh, I don't know, money time, money supply times yeah. velocity. Yeah. Uh, how do you define GDP? Price is said to be also somehow. Uh, I'm sorry to say that again, I didn't get the last part. GDP, um, like there was the, um, according to my understanding, the value of the transaction. Quantity of money times velocity of money. That's the one you're referring to? Break down GDP in all, where is the price in, all, in this equation? Doesn't matter. We're talking about a total of all. The other way to look at this ah, GDP. So goods times the prices would be GDP. Okay, hold on a second. Equals T1 plus T2 plus T3. Okay, transactions times. Okay, so transactions. Whatever value exchanges hands here. I mean, it could be ten dollars. It could be ten ounces. As long as you get a constant unit of measure. And GDP could be a trillion dollars, or it could be, I don't know, a thousand tons equivalent of gold, or whatever. But okay, let's assume that the velocity of money and the quantity of money stays constant, the same, and there is just a um, price. The price is sure. increase. Yes, because then you you do your transactions using a different value. I mean, the the price is included in here, the monetary transaction. I, you know, we're not measuring real stuff. This doesn't measure real stuff. It measures monetary stuff. It measures... Everything has a money, uh, a money label attached to it. Yes, like that is correct. What, what he's suggesting is that if, if the, the quantity of money and the velocity don't change, but prices go up, what you have is an increase in nominal GDP, but no increase in real GDP. They can't be. You, can't, uh, you need a quantitative increase so that the prices can go up. You need more money circling around that they are. Well, the prices go up because there is a deficit of Good goods. Point. Goods are here, but there is a deficit of it, so the price will go up. And 
Right. Well, we have to, Q and V M would change something else. We, we have to assume. Hold on a sec. You have to assume for this. Any money? Huh? Okay, the velocity of money would change. That. Yeah. Hold on a sec. You have to assume that you're using the same unit of measure for one year, and then. The, the, the deflator is applied after to get the real GDP versus the nominal GDP. This is really the nominal GDP. There is a real, de no, real GDP and a nominal GDP. And the real GDP is in constant dollars or constant units. Right? Yeah, Louis? Uh, on that also, before you close, uh, that you mentioned at the very beginning that the Fed to take that the one central bank. But central banks have a direct influence on the quantity yeah. of money, yeah. but they probably spend more time trying to influence velocity of money. Of course. Uh, yes, okay. agreed. So it, it is not that they don't, that's, um, that's why they uh, manage expectations. Yes. So. Sure, job owning and... But uh, they, they, can't, they can't decide what the velocity will be, that's the... Well, they're trying hard now, the, the latest I heard... Uh, people. Sandy, did you tell, are you the guy who told me that they're buying shares? Yeah, the yeah, yeah. They're buying equities now. Yeah, the money that they've been, they've been kicked <laughs> out the So yeah. next they'll buy ch kitchen table, right? Well, uh, there's endless tricks coming out of yeah. the bag. And this is, you know, everything is illegal and it's retroactively made illegal, made legal, because they're not supposed to hold equities, they're only supposed to hold well, originally they were only supposed to hold real bills and gold. Then it was government paper. And then it was, uh, what are these things called? These crazy governmental enterprises, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac paper. And then it's more and more trashy. And now they're going into stocks. Gotta help us out. <laughs> Nobody else will. What's that? Maybe they'll, well, maybe they'll buy gold too. Yeah. That would solve all the problems. <laughs> Okay, I guess that we'll take a break and then think about it and continue after. Yeah, fine. Okay, good. Thanks. Welcome to the question and answer period. Sandy, would you please ask your question again so it would be on the tape? It was, really, it was really a comment that, you know, the, the argument that you were making that, you know, the man in the desert dying first, you know, someone comes up to him, water, you know, and satisfies his need for water, then moves on to the next value scale, canister, satisfies needs for canister, uh, canisters, you know, and then moves on to the camel, you know, again that will satisfy a need, and that's an iterative procedure, and then ultimately, you know, once you've got camels, canisters, palaces, harems, whatever, you know, then, you know, you iterate to gold, and that is what everybody subjectively has iterated to. Okay, I, 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 what I, di I didn't say, but I could say that, go, you know, w Professor talked about how the marginal utility of different stuff is compared, and the highest one it becomes money, or by definition is money. But I can see a little beyond that, or, or, or you have to look at this as perhaps there is a, a quantitative change as well, I'm sorry, a qualitative change as well as quantitative. All of them have declining utility more or less, and one doesn't. So between not having any and having even a little bit, mathematically they ain't the same, right? So uh, I don't want to put that back up again, but perhaps money that is gold, real money, subsumes all these things and it has a unique position. And gold is on the throne and it wasn't always there, but it's been there for I don't know how many thousand years and I, su I suggest it'll be there for quite a while longer. So. If anybody's worried about Sandeep's extraction process, I wouldn't worry about it too much. <laughs> and yeah, if the, if the supply were to explode, the, the bets would be off, but then maybe we'll be get hit by an asteroid and we won't have to worry about that, you know, so that's not. Now, Philip's thing was he had a little bit of discomfort with this inflation and, you know, and all that. And yeah, I have discomfort too. I, I inflate balloons and I deflate balloons. To say you inflate the money supply or you inflate prices, this is kind of silly. So I sort of wrote up a little different um, purchasing power, monetary purchasing power, what money buys. You've got money, whether it's gold, paper, whatever, what does it buy? And, and, and the, the other thing was comparing it to a bottle of wine, or buying a bottle of wine may not be a real good example because the price of the wine could change independent of any inflation, but just will get to that. Uh, real purchasing power is what your work buys. 
your shoveling dirt will buy you enough to eat for the day and maybe a little bump somewhere. Driving a uh, Caterpillar D9 tractor might give you a wonderful lifestyle. Um, so work, between work and money there's an exchange and then between money and goods there's an exchange. And money is a means of exchange here obviously and if this is relatively stable, work and goods, you're okay. But if the money starts to go wacky, up and down, then money sitting in your pocket will change and what you earn will change and what the goods cost will change and <clears throat> then you get into your leads and lags and so on. Um, during so-called inflation, or I don't even use that word, usually this doesn't grow as fast as that and that's the problem. So whatever work you do is exchanged for more money, yeah, you get a raise, but the goods cost even more. And usually during so-called deflation, your work may earn you less money, but the, the goods cost even less, so your purchasing power actually increases. And this is what happened during the Great Depression. If you had a job, your money bought you more goods. No question. So I just want to bring this up. If this part is constant, work and money, work and money, your wages are, are stable, and the price of a bottle of wine goes up, and you choose to buy a bottle of wine more expensive, say instead of $10, it's $20, or, or one gram, ten, uh, two grams, who cares? All, you, might, you must buy less of other stuff if you keep your spending constant. And this, if it's done by more people, obviously will tend to reduce the, the price of other goods. I mean, these, you buy more of one, you buy less of another, otherwise this won't work. Is that okay? You're, your, uh, your income is fixed and you spend 10% of your income on stuff. If you buy one more, if you buy, if one item you buy regularly goes up in price, other stuff will relatively go down because you won't be buying as much. So there's less buying pressure to bid up those prices. Is that clear, Philip? Yeah, yeah. Would you comment on this? Uh, I would, yeah. I, I would say that, um, and this is, uh, by no means a strongly held opinion, but my inclination at the moment is to view inflation purely by its dictionary definition as an expansion of the money supply. And personally, I find the term beyond there, it, it seems to serve to obfuscate, to confuse rather than to clarify. And I think beyond that, it is simply a matter of purchasing power, which is basically really what you just said. So what serves to obfuscate? Um, the use of inflation outside of that simple meaning of an expansion of the money supply. Mm -hmm. Any use of it after that in, with regard to okay. prices, it doesn't, for me it doesn't clarify it. It's just purchasing power after that. Mm -hmm. It's not really inflation related. It might be inflation related. Okay. Uh, well, the, but it's an effect. Quality. It's an effect. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, maybe we'll, well, well, how much time do we have to spend here? Well, 20 minutes. Okay, so maybe we'll jump ahead a little bit. Because I'm going to start to compare this gold business to the paper business. Uh, remember I wrote this little equation which is subject to uh, a lot of limitations, equals Money supply times velocity of money, right? Okay, <clears throat> now, as long as we keep these, the, the units constant, we, get, we can get something out of this. If you've got 10, 10 trillion here equals uh, one, oops, one trillion times 10 velocity. Okay, now under gold standard, things are quite different. What is the money supply? Under gold, your money supply breaks into two components, gold plus bills. Now I use money supply, but it really means as a means of financing transactions, okay, a means of exchange times velocity equals your GDP, okay? Now, gold is fixed. <coughs> There's a certain quantity of gold, it cannot change, it does not change. There's, uh, depending if you believe Yamashito's gold or not, there's 160,000 or 260,000, whatever, it's above ground. And it changes very slowly. 
by the mine supply. So in effect, certainly over a one year period it's negligible. And then you've got bills, real bills. Now these are obviously a means of exchange. They finance transactions. Gold, real bills, times velocity. Now, what is velocity? That's what people, how quickly people spend their money. So if they spend their money faster, it generates more real bills automatically. If, you, if, people, if Christmas time is coming and you buy a bunch of turkeys, bills are drawn against turkeys. Bills are in circulation for 90 days. After uh, Christmas, nobody's buying turkeys, the turkey bill is paid off from the gold supply. Therefore, there's a very immediate, well, it's a feedback loop, but it's actually, these two things vary proportionately. They, as one goes up, the other goes up. It must. Yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. And when it goes down, this must go down. And this has not changed. So there's no central banker pumping paper money or sopping up liquidity. That's such a lovely expression, sopping, as if money were barf that you want to sop up off. <laughs> that's that's Keynes came up with this, I think. Yeah. We're talking about gold here with a capital G and you have to take it a little more, more seriously. Not, I don't wear a tin hat, but anyway. Um, so there's no feedback problem because it's immediate, instantaneous, boom, bills are drawn, bills are not drawn. And your GDP, it comes out the other end. Now what gold serves as is the stability, the anchor, and the numeraire, the, the quantity of, now again I said this morning that the total quantity of this is quite irrelevant. Suppose there's only a little tiny bit of gold, only a miserable 150 tons, that's enough to run the whole British Empire, or call it 200 tons at the end of it. Why? Because everything is valued at a larger number. That is to say, uh, instead of one ounce of gold buying you a suit, it's one gram of gold will buy you a suit. And when you draw a bill against it, you'll have a different number on it. You'll have a different number on it, right? Is that clear? Yeah. But its real value is a bunch of turkeys or the shoes, or the milk, or the gasoline going to the gas station. Uh, I think maybe in my book I talk about the gas station. A, a truck pulls up to the gas station delivering 30,000 liters of fuel. Well, is the guy going to go into the till and hand out gold coins for today's world cash? No. Is he going to write a check for 30,000 liters of fuel? No, he's going to take these, accept the bill, he says, yeah, you delivered 30,000 uh, liters, payable in 90 days, 60 days, whatever the term is. And then the money comes in, as the retail sales are made, and it accumulates, and then the bill is paid. And of course, that bill represents the value of that gasoline. And if the cost of gasoline goes from one uh, euro per liter, I don't know, to two euros per liter, now that bill drawn against that same 30,000 liter is simply numerated at twice the number. But the real value hasn't changed. It's still 30,000 liters and when you drive your car, one liter takes you how many, whatever distance, or vice versa. And that's why this is a very interesting point. Your, your true value of this gold, it can't be infinite, obviously, if you have endless supply, then it will lose its monetary value. But within a big range, it really doesn't matter. Another point, I think Philip mentioned this, or no, was Sandy, he said, what happens if mine supply cuts off? Well, we've only got 160,000 tons of gold to work with. Oh my God, that's really tough. I don't think it makes any difference. It makes no difference. It may mean that gold becomes a little more valuable, and, and again, longer term, the price mechanism will kick in. I mean, it, it, you know, it takes, what was the number they said that if there's a change in interest rates, it takes at least 18 months for it to trickle through the economy. 18 months, that's a year and a half. Your, your economy has done this three times during that time and the signal hasn't even arrived yet. What the heck? And, and the price signal also. But this is instantaneous. This is not even the next day. This is as the gas truck drives up, the bill is dropped. Now, the demand drives this, right? 
So the demand goes up, goes down. Let's suppose there's no gas at the refinery. The refinery is maxed out, cannot possibly produce more fuel. It's running 724. Send me 30,000 liters of fuel. We're desperate. Our tanks are empty. We don't have any. No bill is growing. It can't be. So the, the physical limit of the economy comes in to limit this. Now you must have heard the uh, overheating of the economy uh, when uh, the, the capacity utilization is maxed out and the Fed starts to talk about putting on the brakes and increasing interest rates and all this shit. But forget it, it's, it's right here. And if, if it's one industry, you bet that the price mechanism will kick in and the refineries will be built and, or, the, or whatever. But if it's, the, if it's a large segment of the economy, it will automatically stop this overheating because there are no more turkeys to deliver at Christmas, you're going to have to eat something else. And there are no more uh, consumer goods available at this moment, so this, this increase stops. Built in. Everything is built in. It's all automatic, it's all natural, and it's all wonderful. So, you know, the, the gold standard with this component, I think it answers all the questions that you can possibly come up with. I think that's a beautiful little equation down the bottom, really. Isn't it? Yeah, the real bills and the velocity, it's just wonderful. It's, it's, it's ever so simple. It, it, it reduces it to the simplicity it is, yes. the clarity and the instantaneousness of it. Yeah. And, and then you can, the you, know, you can extend these to overseas transactions, you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, um, you imply that the increase in the amount of real bills will mm -hmm. increase the velocity of No, the opposite way. The opposite way. Because the velocity is actually how quickly spend their money. So think about it this way. People are saving their money for the Christmas shopping season. Velocity is low. They're, 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 they're hoarding. Then Christmas is coming, you'll buy this, 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 this. <clears throat> Boom, velocity goes up. A lot of spending happens. Bills are drawn instantly as that merchandise moves off the shelf. Well, as the replacement merchandise comes in. I mean, merchants anticipate this. They already load up their shelves in anticipation of the Christmas season. So the bills are there, as the professor so aptly put it, before the demand even arrives. They're already there. They're already, there's already enough um, purchasing uh, power or circulating stuff or whatever you want to call it. Not quite money, but the means of, the means of exchange, it's all there. Because those goods have gone to the retail store and the bills are already in circulation. Is that clear? Is that so again, if you, it, let's say most people buy a turkey, well, let's say they want to have a turkey dinner for Christmas. Well, when do they buy the turkey? Not very long before, it'll, it'll rot, it'll go bad. So <laughs> a couple of days before Christmas, all these women descend on the shopping cart, turkey's gone. But those turkeys were delivered to the supermarket a week or two before, and the bill was signed, received 1,000 turkeys for uh, whatever value, and that, that bill is already in circulation. And then, 30, 60 days after Christmas, they go away, they disappear. Yeah, uh, yes, Louis? The uh, velocity of money under the, the gold standard with real bills mm. may not be the same concept. It's not really in, in this, you go from monetary supplies, time, velocity of money, that goes GDP as a quantity to mm -hmm. theory of money. Mm -hmm. And then you say, okay, money supply under gold standard is gold and, and, and real bills. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. MS times V. But um, to take it through, because velocity changes as the real bills change in quantity. So I'm just trying to picture in my mind what happens in terms of GDP. Mm -hmm. Probably GDP itself is a concept that shouldn't exist under the gold standard. Then yeah. that's what the answer mm -hmm. is. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but all that matters is, is you know, that okay. as the demand for goods increases, the necessary supply of money increases automatically yes. because of the direct relationship. Okay. But so my, I guess my question is, 
And you talk through what V is in a gold standard, and, and I, I would suggest it's, it can be the same. Thing. It's not quite the same. Well, first of all, the GDP is the total for one year. And that is this, whether it's you know, big in one month and low in another month. So the, the deannualized rate, the monthly GDP, will vary over the period of the year, right? Because yeah. it'll be larger here and smaller there or whatever. Now, it, let's just put that back. Um, the other one is cash plus credit times velocity equals GDP. This was under the paper system where cash, but remember cash is actually another form of credit. So it's kind of, you know, and this credit is probably credit card credit and, and it's carries huge interest rates and it's brutally damaging. Whereas here, cash is gold and this part is fixed and the real bills vary. Now here, probably these two vary as well. But again, the uh, central bank tries to vary this and this is not fixed I guess is what I'm saying because this is the, the real money the paper money supply is subject to change so a lot of problems crop up whereas this is fixed this is the anchor uh, as far as velocity I mean you know yeah it's slightly different I don't want to get you can go you, but the thing is I, I believe like Philip said we're starting from the root and working up and you could say well how many gold coins change hands and generate how much transactions on, on this. It could be a lot. Remember we, I talked about the amplifying factor? Because every consumer purchase triggers a lot of economic activity or a lot of economic activity has to take place before the consumer can buy that piece of bread or that, that uh, clothing or whatever. Yeah. The more I think about it, that's it. GDP is irrelevant under the gold standard because it's uh, it, the currency, the money is not uh, <coughs> issued by the state. Yes. What's relevant is the purchase power of your money, or not even that, Louis. What's really relevant is the purchase power of your effort. Mm -hmm. What work you do, how much does that benefit? Sovereign individual. Yeah. And, and of course, this spreads out through whole society. Everybody works or does something unless they're thieves, I mean, stand back, there's only two ways to earn money, or there's two ways to acquire wealth. One is legitimate, one is illegitimate. Legitimate means earning it through work or trade or producing something, or it's gifted to you. Somebody gives you a charity or your mom and dad and, and you inherit. Those are legitimate. And the other possibility is stealing it at gunpoint, violence, threat of violence, taxation and so on, or con artistry, cheating people out of their money through lies and deceit. That's the only way. So if you're, when I, when I talk about work here, I'm talking about honest work. I'm not saying if you pull a gun and get money, how productive are you? <laughs> you know, you're destroying society. <laughs> Big heist is more productive. I mean, uh, so, well, I don't know, are we finished? I think so. If you. Yes. If you pay a, a little bit before maturity, do you get a discount? Yes. Yes, that, that is a time preference and so on. Why shouldn't you? Why should you, you know, you, you're doing the other guy a favor. You're giving him access to the money before, you're in, before he's really entitled to it or when, it, when it's due. So he's got this gold or this money and he can put it to use for some other purpose, earning some other stuff. He could go out and buy another bill, he could put uh, goods on his shelf, whatever, buy a bond with it, and earn interest. Yes? Sorry, I would just like to come back to, to this um, point, because as this session is called Critical Quantitative Theory, um, which you mentioned before the break, um, for instance, California Gold Rush, you, you were actually admitting or saying, okay, there, were monetary, there was monetary inflation during that time, but what's your argument against it, or it, it, well, it, it's, it was not uh, globalized okay. enough, the world, or, or how can someone... I, I think you have, this, it, you know, again, that word inflation is not very, uh, not very, it's not very helpful. What I can say is that it costs more, well, you have to translate to labor, labor hours. How much labor hours did the miner dig out the gold, and how much did it buy him? But of course this is all hit and miss because one miner could have been digging for days and find nothing and the other one hits it rich, it's El Dorado. So these are 
local variations. But when we talk about uh, monetary uh, effects, we're talking about the whole big picture, the whole country or perhaps the whole world. So uh, the other thing would be that if these guys are able to pay a lot of money for shipping to get themselves to the uh, California or, or pay a, a fortune for a shovel, but somebody else was deprived or the price of other things changed to reflect that because there was not global inflation, there was only local, you know, uh, local increase in the, in the monetary metal. I, I'm just trying to, because people say that if more money enters the system, inflation occurs. And that's not, or rather, prices increase. But that's not necessarily true if we concede that on the big picture, the uh, constant marginal utility of gold or of money is constant, then if there's more money, it won't increase prices. Well, okay, let's, let's, let's look at that a little more. You get more money, what can you do with it? There's one of three things only. You can hoard it, you know, your liquidity preference, stuff it in your pocket, your mattress. You can save it, or put it another way, put it into an a, a, a interest earning account or a bond or something, or you can spend it. Now, if it's spent, this affects the, the, and I'm talking about a gold standard with real bills, this affects the propensity to, to consume and it's reflected in discount rate, not prices. If you stuff it in your pockets, it has no, no real effect, right? It's new gold in your pocket, it might as well be sitting in the ground. And if you invest in bonds or investment, then that has an effect on the interest rate. I don't see where big effect on prices take place. Didn't you say the prices were rising? Yeah. yeah, but I didn't say it's because more gold came up. I said it's because these guys had to pay a lot of money to get there, and it was difficult to get goods to them, so natural price increases rather than inflationary stuff happened. Prices increased. I mean, if you want to buy that, that 30,000 liter truck, if you have to drive it up to Alaska from the refinery, it costs more. And believe me, gas costs a lot more in Alaska. Just uh, yeah. on that point, inflation is um, generated and is bad uh, because it's not evenly distributed. That's a point which, That's which I would agree with, but yeah. just leave it there and say it because it was so so costful to get there and it's kind of a coincidence yeah. when the dark world is gold out. No. Da, 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 but the miner who found the gold is wealthier yeah. for having found the gold. Yeah. He puts it in his pocket, spends it invests it, um, doesn't matter, he's wealthier. Uh, but uh, the fact that there's a, a big increase in gold uh, quite suddenly because it's discovered there uh, has, has a, a different impact to, to the people who find gold and the economy locally than trickling down. Uh, fine with it, fine with it, but yeah, that's fine, that's fair, I have no problem with that. By, by the time that gold reaches everyone, <laughs> Its purchasing power is a lot less than when it was found. Yeah, th these things yes. play out over time. I mean, it, it takes time for the gold to distribute, to go into whatever it's going to go to. So, a local, big, it's like suddenly a, a huge demand for stuff somewhere. The market has to react to it. Uh, yeah, Peter, you were going to say something? Yes. Well, in view of the discount rate theory that mm -hmm. the professor has um, made an expose on. Let's, let's see what is in fact happening in a, in a gold mine situation. The miners have a gold find. They take this and convert them into real bills. Let's see why. Why, why to real bills? Well, they can put it in the bank, they can go to the saloon, but surely some of them do. But they would have to, if they want to earn something, by the time they are going back to the mine and come back with new supplies, they can earn a discount on these 90. They, they purchase bills because by the time they come back, they have their gold plus something. You see? Yeah. If there are no more bills in that region to be drawn, because the bank can offer them no more bills for sale, okay, this is where it comes in. They, can have, they will have to draw bills on mining supplies, well, from a lot further out. This is where the boats come in, but the supply lines become longer now and the costs increase. And if there are any so called inflationary effects, that's, this is not due to the supply of gold as such, it is to the longer supply lines. 
because the gold supply will just reduce the discount. I think this is a good, good, good way to approach this. These miners were a bunch of wild mountain men. Now, I don't think there are very many of them very sophisticated to buy bills. The ones who were did. I think they're the kind of guys who take gold, I'm off to the tavern. Go <laughs> sit, little sack of money. How much, how much whiskey will you give me for this? Oh, uh, I'll give you a double shot. That's What's the price of that? You see? <laughs> so they're out of whack. They're not in this <laughs> real bill circulation too much. And yeah, the whiskey price is ridiculous because they were being taken advantage of. There was, and this is kind of fraudulent too. I mean, obviously these were many of them. Now some of them were more sophisticated, and I would suggest that the, so the who got rich under under this. Uh, gold discovery. It wasn't the miners. Yeah, it was those who exploiting the spread and the power. The shovel yeah, makers. the shovel makers <laughs> and those shovel makers bought bills and they did all the right thing and and of course they brought the spread down because eventually most of the miners quit. When 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 the uh, Yukon opened to gold, the gold rush. The, the people were crazy. They were crazy, and the Canadian government. They were going into the wilderness, into the northern Canada, the tundra, to dig gold, gold fever. And the Canadian government set up a regulation that, you, and the RCMP was there on the uh, Chilkoot Trail to enforce it. That you needed, I don't, I think it was two tons of supplies. Remember the number by any chance? Uh, anyway, so they had to make multiple trips up this Chilkoot uh, uh, Trail, uh, carrying stuff. And then, if you go up, his all the like stoves and God knows what. And they abandoned all this, and they were running after the gold. So they, they did crazy things, and many of them died. So you, this is a, what do you call those things, a fat tail event? Mm -hmm. The normal rules don't necessarily apply, things go ballistic. Can I just play, uh, ask, pose a question to you, playing devil's advocate along the line of what Mark's saying. Is it possible that there actually was an inflation at the mine as in, an uh, sorry, a loss of purchasing power due to the fact that the purchasing power of gold was not being balanced by the cost of acquiring more of it. In other words, it, because it was right there at the mine and they had shovels and picks That's a good and point. access. It was easy gold, yeah. It was a little sure. easier there yeah. than I anywhere think, else. Yes. I think that's it a good to be true. Sure. And then, then there was, I mean, the guy had gold, gold, oh my God, I'm rich, I'm rich. But then the bartender or the egg merchant said, oh, he's got gold. Yeah, yeah. You know. Where's the guy in the city with the so, gold? So, yeah, by the time this, the this trickled down, it only, if you were a farmer yeah. 100 miles away, you hardly felt any of this. Yeah. And then the people that are surrounding this gold mine will fight left, right, and center to sell goods in this town. Yes. Yeah. yes. And, I mean, they were, some of them were killing each other for the claims, and, you know. Bets are off. This is wild. And then, if the police ever, or authority ever showed up, I know, you know, then things change. But what I'm trying to say is that this increase does not cause a big increase or a or a worldwide increase in in uh, the demand for you know it doesn't destroy that at all. Now, if there were if there were thousands of these things and huge unlimited supply, that's a different story. But even I even the uh, Spanish. The Spanish guy stole a bunch of gold and it caused a lot of problems in Spain, but it didn't destroy the gold standard. And it, it might have been a blip here. It caused a lot of problems in South America. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, both and, both and, of them and, were made by the king of Spain, not yeah. by gold. You know, morally, there's no difference, morally, there's no difference between stealing gold at gunpoint and stealing it through taxation and through insidious inflation and so on. It's a little bit more sabotage, but well, I'll give you an example. Um, people think when they buy a house, they own it. Okay. And it used to be that way. But then, take a mortgage against it, and do you own it? Well, if you stop your payments, it's, it's gone. You don't own it. The, the bank has a claim against the house. A claim against means a prior claim. It means they own it. And the deal is, you can live in it as long as you make your payments. <clears throat> so at some day, oh, mortgage paid off day, the bank says, okay, we have no more claim against your claim against your house. Your house is yours. What is it? Try not paying your, paying your property taxes. Just try. And so, and I speak from personal experience. My daughter Annie bought a house in, in a suburb of Montreal, around $300,000 pretty nice little house, nothing, not a Mac mansion. And she messed up 
on some of her tax payment. She missed $65. And she received a, one letter, a letter of notification from the city hall, you owe $65. And they kind of lost this with the junk mail. Well, guess what happened next? She picked up a newspaper and she was studying real estate. Uh, she's now a real estate broker. And she saw her house for sale in that newspaper. The government had put her house for sale for back taxes due, $65. No uh, judgment, no legal recourse, no due process, uh, no, no bailiff. The house is for sale. And she said, Dad, my house is for sale. My God, what am I going to do? I said, well, don't panic. Pay the $65. <laughs> But see, so who owns the house? Yeah. The first claim owns the house. Who owns your salary? My salary. Uh, deduction at source. The government. They own us all. They own all our property and they most graciously let us keep some of it. How much? I don't know. Uh, there have been, you know, 90% income tax rates in the, you know about some of this stuff. So under a gold standard, we decide. We own the coin. Our coin, it's our money, and we will or will not do whatever we choose to do or not. Whatever is left is debased. Sorry? Whatever is left is debased. Yeah. Anyway, so maybe we should go to lunch? All right, so we'll talk more about this this afternoon. I already covered most of it.